You know, you, you have a beautiful night and you're thinking, just piece of cake, I'll just have church on my front porch. Oops. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray you'd be with us this evening as we open again your scripture. Lord, you included this book for a reason because you designed the relationship between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, the joys, Lord, the desire, the two becoming one. And Lord, I pray that as we open your word, you would again let it be an encouragement to us. And Lord, may we see it for what it was intended to be, pure, lovely, and blessed of God. Our world has lost its mind on these issues. But I pray, Lord, you would help us to renew our minds from your scripture this evening. And so we thank you and we ask that you would open your word to every heart that is here, every heart that is listening, and let it work in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So chapter 6, we've been having these dialogues, and as we got started, we noticed in Song of Solomon that Solomon's response was about a verse to pretty much everything the... the First, his um, betrothed, and then finally to chapter 3, we got to the marriage procession, and finally into 4, the consummation of the marriage, the marriage feast, and all that they had talked about, and then the, the ongoing relationship of the couple, chapter 5, and so we're here at chapter 6 as we roll along, and it's interesting, as, as the marriage moves forward, you find Solomon talks more, just pointing that out to you as you work your way through, but chapter 6, verse 1, we left with this cliffhanger, and that is, whither is thy beloved gone? O thou fairest among women, whither is thy beloved turned aside that we may seek him with thee? Where is he? And she answers, verse 2, my beloved has gone down into his garden. Now how many by now have figured out that it could be a literal garden, but it seems to be speaking more of intimate activity between the two of them? Everybody? None of you? Okay. Well, anyway, <clears throat> so she's mentioning that she has his affection and, uh, and his attention. My beloved, again, my romantic, my companion, yeah, is gone down into his garden to the beds of spices to feed in the gardens. Again, most agreeing, this speaks of them being romantically involved. And to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. And again, speaking of romantic activity. And it may be, as chapter 6 opens up, you know, Where's your beloved? We're going to learn as we go through here that she is within a harem and there are other spouses. You're kind of like, oh, what a letdown. Well, I'm just telling you what's coming. I didn't write it. Uh, and so this idea seems to be perhaps they're saying, well, how's it going now? And the answer is, I still have his affection. And, you know, that's something very important within marriage. It's, it's one thing in the courtship and then the wedding night, but it's very important to continue that relationship into the married relationship, into the married life together. And some of the secrets are don't stop dating. Don't stop having fun together. I mean, obviously, you don't have to spend much to do that. Don't sp stop spending time together. And it, and it gets difficult when, if and when God brings some children in your life and, and, you know, you think as they get bigger, it'll get easier, and then they stay up later, see? And then that gets, but that time you spend talking to them and investing in them will pay dividends later. But this reminder here, sort of, you know, so where is he now? Well, you know, he's gone into his garden. We're still doing well is the idea. I am my beloved's. She's declaring, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. I have his attention. And speaking of that, Solomon appears to begin to speak in verse 4. Thou art beautiful or fair. Again, notice how he is complimentary to his bride. Very important words of affirmation, especially for ladies and gentlemen, to receive from their spouse. Thou art beautiful, O my love. Again, my companion, my maiden. As Tirzah, a city apparently known for its beauty. The word also means pleasantness. Comely or beautiful as Jerusalem, which is a beautiful city, even now. Terrible as an army with banners. The idea is impressive. It's an impressive array. Even just her, her movement is something that captures his attention. So he's telling her, you are beautiful. You're right. I am yours. You're beautiful. You're comely as Jerusalem in Tirza. You're as impressive, in a sense, as an army with banners. Verse 5, interesting. Turn away thine eyes from me, for they have overcome me. What is he saying? It's Wednesday night. It's late. We just look, we got out from work, man. Just tell us, will you? 
In the Middle East, uh, eyes and, and beautiful countenance was considered to be very important, especially for ladies. And so if you remember, for example, Jacob, when you read there, it said Leah was tender-eyed. How many remember that? Leah was tender-eyed, Rachel, beautiful countenance. And so some say that's a nice attempt to say she's, you know, or we'll find out when we get to heaven. But it was so this idea that her eyes are, are very capturing, you know, very sort of entrapping or capturing to him. When he sees her eyes, she gives him those little looks, you know, and, and that's it. So he's saying here the idea of turn away thine eyes from me because they're the kind of look that he can't say no to. And if you think, well, come on, you're overdoing this. Okay, left turn, Proverbs 6. Left turn, Proverbs 6. Let's have a look. Chapter 6, verse 20, Proverbs. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou wakest, it shall talk with thee. The word of God will guide you. And instruct you. For the commandment is a lamp. And by the way, Middle Eastern lamps are just enough to see your next step so you don't fall or stumble. This is not a you know, LED bulb with a lithium ion battery. This is a little flickering lamp. The commandment is a lamp and the law is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep thee from the evil woman. From the flattery of the tongue of a strange or foreign to you woman. Lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take you with her eyes. Those little glances and looks and playful things. And what she's doing is setting you up, is what he was warning in Proverbs 6. So again, that, that idea, that warning. Solomon here is saying, you know, you are beautiful, you're as impressive as an army, and when you give me one of those looks, I'm whipped. We call that banter. For they have overcome me. Back to our chapter, chapter 6, verse 5. So he goes on complimenting now his wife. Turn away thine eyes for me, from me, for they have overcome me. Thy hair is as the flock of goats that appear from Gilead. Again, that would be considered a compliment in the Middle East. The idea, again, the hair, the color of the hair, and just the long hair and all that. So you can Google them. Thy teeth, we've been through this before, but he's reminding her again. And by the way, let me state the obvious. The things he was saying to her early on in their relationship... We're not sure how much time has passed here in these chapters. He is still saying to her later on in their relationship. And gentlemen, it's quite important for a wife to know that no matter where you are and how many years of your relationship, she's still beautiful to you. Very important. And conversely, ladies, it's important for your husband to know that he's still desired by you. He's still important to you. We can often become very comfortable and forget to communicate some of the most basic and yet simple things, and that is affirming one another as a husband or as a wife. And if we aren't careful to do that and relationally take the time with each other, especially guys investing in the hearts of your wives, ladies also relationally investing in your husbands and affirming him as a man, you you grow separately, as we said. The guy buries himself in his work. She buries herself in the family. They try to fill that void, and then someone else comes along and pays the attention to them that you or she should have been paying to their spouse. It doesn't make it right if they fall, you know, susceptible to an affair or to an emotional affair or to whatever it may be, but it sure doesn't make it any easier to say no when you're starving. And so interestingly enough, yeah, we've heard this before from Solomon, but we don't know how much time has gone by, but as he talks to her, he talks about how he's still overwhelmed by her presence around among him he desires to be with her she's beautiful to him and you know she just whips him with a certain look from her eyes and she's again you know these same descriptions your your hair just like a flock of goats from Gilead your teeth there's a flock of sheep which again speaking the idea that they're washed as they're going up from a washing they're white everyone beareth twins you're not missing any we talked about all this there's not one barren among them so again still just enraptured with her her love, or captivated by it. Verse 7, he continues, As a piece of pomegranate are thy temples within thy locks. And again, just her beauty, the complexion of her skin. And then we get this, verse 8. There are threescore queens. How many is that? Sixty. She's one of sixty. But it goes on. And fourscore, that would be eighty, concubines. 
and virgins without number. Now he's speaking. Now ladies, I don't know if I'd feel, that would be a bit of a discouragement personally. You, well, I'm absolutely enraptured with you and just taken up. And you know those other 60 wives and 80 concubines? Just What's happening here? Where does Solomon end up in this? 700 wives, 300 concubines. It's crazy. Now, in the East, the larger your harem, the more your stature, your wealth, etc. And Solomon did make many political marriages as well, as far as Pharaoh's daughter and some other things for sake of, uh, should we say, diplomacy would be how we view it now, in a sense. So there were certain pacts and relationships being established with surrounding territories. Uh, however, the warning was, if your king multiplies wives, three things you should multiply. One, wives. Two, horses. Three, Gold and silver. What did Solomon multiply? One, wives. Two, horses. We'll show you stables if you go with us to Israel sometime. Three, gold and silver. How did it work out for him? Terribly. Because his trust went from being on the Lord to these other things. And those foreign wives with their foreign pagan worship eventually led his heart away from God. And so when you look at Israel, for example, you have Mount Scopus to the north. You have the Mount of Olives. You've all heard of that. Just to the east, you have... Directly west of that, Mount Moriah, you've heard that name before. West of that, you have Mount Zion. And then you have in that southern valley there, that rim, that's called the Hill of Shame. And it's named the Hill of Shame because that's where Solomon's foreign wives began to set up their idolatrous practices and he succumbed to it. How's that for a name? Hill of Shame. Rising up out of the Valley of Gehenna, or Hinnon Valley coming out. So, not exactly what we hope for. However, in mentioning this, verse 8, by the way, again, second thought to this, in the flesh, a thousand wives will not satisfy. But in the spirit, one woman for one man for life is more than enough. Solomon was feeding flesh. You know, it's a strange thing. He wrote us Proverbs, yes? He wrote a bunch of songs, yes? All this great wisdom, but what did he fail to do? Walk in the truth he knew. I meet with people, or I'll, people stop me here or there or whatever, and they, hey, Pastor, can I talk to you about it? Yeah, sure, what do you got? And they'll, they'll lay something out, and, and, uh, and they'll lay out their whole scenario. And I'll say, well, you know what you need to do, right? And guess what I hear almost every single time? Yeah, and guess what they quote next? The verse, or, or essentially the scripture that would speak truth to that situation. Yeah, I know I should, you know, forsake all others. And I know I should, you know, I, I know. And they know the answer, but they don't want to do it. And they're upset because things aren't working out. If Solomon is ever an object lesson, it is, here you can have incredible wisdom, discernment, and understanding to the word of God. Or at least writing things like Proverbs. But if you don't have a heart to walk in the truth you know, at the end you're not going to be very fruitful. When I mention you King David, what do you think? Pretty good. A couple you know, problems along the way, but generally David was a man with a heart after God. Even in his failures, he never left or abandoned God and went to the pagan gods. He came back and said, oh God, and he cried out and he reconciled with God and as much as he could with those around him. Solomon, what about him? He got led away to pagan gods. People say, you know, I want to learn Hebrew. Or I want to learn Greek. Those are good things, but I encourage you for your walk, the best thing to learn is no. 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 He's just gonna, no. If you, if you can just master, no. You'll, anyway. It's a good thing to know. No. So anyway, back to this, three score queens, four score concubines, virgins without number, but, verse 9, but my dove, in other words, yes, I have this harem, I have these individuals, but you're the one who has my heart. And that's why, again, most who read this letter and comment on it say that perhaps this is the only true love relationship that Solomon knew as far as a genuine, it wasn't politically motivated, it wasn't, you know, peace treaty motivated, whatever it may be, it was, it was a genuine relationship. We'll find out when we get to heaven, but he's saying to her, there are these others, but you are the one. Very important, forsake all others. And so verse 9, my dove, yes, he called her that before, and yes, it's a term of endearment there. My dove... My undefiled is but one. So yes, there are three score queens, four score concubines, but she's the one. She's but one. She is the only one of her mother. She's unique. 
She is the choice one of her that bear her. The daughters saw her and blessed her. Yea, the queens and the concubines, they praised her, clearly seeing that she was again a standout, unique, and received the praise of others. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning? Fair as the moon, clear as the sun. Terrible, again, as impressive as an army with banners. Again, just overwhelming Solomon's heart, clearly wrapped up in her. And so he gives her again this, this sense of encouragement. Verse 11. She appears to return now some speech, most feel to herself. I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley. Again, garden metaphor for them having activity. I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourished and the pomegranate budded or sparkled or shined. So my husband tells me I'm the only one. And so I went to see and I had his affection in a sense. Verse 12, or ever I was aware... My soul made me like the chariots of Aminadab. Again, this, this known for swiftness and for desirability. Verse 12, here in the translation we have, or ever I was aware, that's what they give us. But if you remember, when, they, when, the Greek, when Alexander the Great came through, everybody ended up speaking Greek, including Jews who didn't live in Jerusalem anymore, and pretty soon they couldn't speak Hebrew anymore. They could only read and speak Greek, And so eventually they said, well, we want our scriptures in Greek. So they did that about 200 BC and they called it the Septuagint because there were 70 scholars, LXX Septuagint, that were used to make that translation. Well, the Septuagint has for verse 12, I'm simply letting you know what's out there. Here instead of, or ever I was aware, they translated it, there will I give you my breasts. Because again, this idea of intimate play back and forth She's saying, I went down to the garden, I'm his only, he's affirmed that, and so she gives his affection. Just stating it for the record in case you're reading the Septuagint and saying he missed it. Verse 13, no wonder life streams off. <laughs> return, return, O Shulamite, return, return, that we may look on thee. Okay, so you're being talked up by Solomon, you're this, this standout among 60 wives and 80 concubines, Show yourself. Return, O turn, O Shulamite. Return, O turn, that we may look upon thee. What will you see in the Shulamite? As it were, the company of two armies, this sort of impressive array moving that draws one's attention. She has everyone's attention because she has Solomon's. So chapter 7. Solomon again, again begins to speak. Chapter 7, verse 1. How beautiful are thy feet with thy shoes or with shoes. Let me translate. Nice shoes, babe. <laughs> How many times, well, maybe I, I should correct this. Not many guys that, are, are, uh, that I hang out with say, dude, nice shoes. But how often do you hear ladies say, nice shoes. Oh, do you like those? I got them at whatever warehouse, or I got them at this place. And, I, and they were 20% off, and they had two for one. And they got, and how do I know this? Because I have seven daughters and a wife. <laughs> See, even Jane, she's like, my shoes. Two years old, my shoes. The boys just throw them on and out they go, right? But So here he pays a compliment to her feet and her shoes. And yet how many women do you hear, I can't wear open-toed shoes. Why? I don't like my feet. Why don't you like your feet? Well, because they're feet. Oh, we all have feet. Yes, but my feet are feet, feet. What's... <laughs> Tell me I'm wrong. Okay, then. Some of you, I can't remember. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter? Uh, we start at the feet. Everybody with me? Okay, the joints of thy thighs, hips, the idea, loins, are like jewels. The work of the hands of a cunning workman. Gee, here we are, they've been married for a while, and he still compliments her appearance and how much he's desirous of her and attracted to her. And by the way, guys, again, affirmation to your wife is a very important thing, that you still desire her through the years. It was said one time, uh, we had a Bible college teacher named Larry Hood, wonderful godly man. He was from Twin Peaks Chapel up there in the mountains. And he said, you know, the world's definition of a great lover is, is one man who satisfies a whole lot of women during his lifetime. He said, that's the world's definition. But as you read through the scripture, God's definition is one man who can satisfy one woman through all the changes of life. I was like, wow, that's good. So here he is still paying compliment, and, uh, and now he's including shoes. So apparently he's gotten even smarter. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. Guys, when your wife says, how do I look? 
got you. I heard that, right? You're like, ah, oh, ah. Oh, do I want to ruin the evening? Do it if I'm not. If, is this a setup? Does she already not like the outfit? You know. You say, baby, you look great. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. The joints of thy thighs are like jewels. Again, he appreciates her form. The work of the hands of a cunning workman. Thy navel, now we start at the feet. Everybody with me? Okay, I'm just going to point things out. You can decode this at home. Thy navel is like a round goblet which wanteth not liquor, or the idea of mixed wine. So, okay. Thy belly, that is beten in the Hebrew, that's abdomen or the area of the womb. And we're working our way up. You can figure this out at home. So your feet are lovely with their shoes. The joints of your thighs are like jewels. Thy navel, this, this lower part of your body, like a round goblet which wanteth not liquor. Yes, this is a PG book. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat. Guys, you got another one. Thou hast dove's eyes. Oh, say it again. Say it again. You've got hair like goats. Oh, say it again. Your teeth are like sheep and not one's missing. Say it again. It's awesome. Your tummy's like a pile of wheat. Modern translation, people be, your belly's like a washboard ab. Right? I mean, it's funny, the difference. Thy belly is like a heap of wheat. See how that works for you, fellas. Set with the lilies. By the way, lower abdomen. Thy two breasts. <gasps> it's like the fourth or fifth time it's in this book. It's in Proverbs too. Let me show you. Proverbs 5. Turn left. This keeps showing up. Proverbs 5. Warns about again. Uh, adultery warns against the strange woman, chapter 5, verses 1, going on all the way up to about 14. Just be careful, watch out for this. And then the positive information or instruction is drink water out of your own cistern. Now, he's not talking about having your own canteen. This is about intimacy with your wife. Running waters put out of your, out of your own well. Let your fountains be dispersed abroad. Rivers of waters in the streets. So, you know, don't spread them out with others. Let them be only thine and not strangers with thee. Well, why can't I give a stranger a drink from our... Oh, that's not talking about drinking water. Let thy fountain be blessed, the intimacy between you and your wife, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as a loving hind in a pleasant row. Here it is again. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times. And be thou ravished always with her love. And why will you, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? Watch out, because your ways are before the eyes of God. Interesting. You know, you read through this and you, you begin to get the opinion that God's actually for intimacy. Yeah, where? Within the context of a marriage. Yeah, exactly. Who created it? God. Who intended it to be enjoyed for a lifetime? God. There is a pure and a lovely aspect to this, that it should be within marriage. So back to our chapter. Again, we started at toes, we're working our way up. Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. Again, the idea of you come into a field and here they are and they're graceful and sleek and beautiful and all that. Thy neck is as the tower is as a tower of ivory. That's kind of a different visual for us. Thine eyes are like fish pools. Try that one at home, fellas. The idea is calm, peaceful, beautiful, in Heshbon, so not only a fish pool, it's the fish pool in Heshbon, and it's by the gate of Bath Rabim, in case you were there. Here's another good one. Thy nose is as the Tower of Lebanon. Look, okay, how many are understanding Hebrew poetry is not quite what we would do today, right? You know, what do you, well, what do you like about me? Baby, I love the fact your nose is like the Tower of Babylon or the Tower of Lebanon. What is he implying? Straight and well proportioned. Well, why didn't he just say that? Because they're Hebrew poetry. That's what he's saying. Why don't you just say it? You know, nice straight nose. Pointing it out. And thy nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which looketh well toward Damascus, straight, well formed. Thine head, remember we worked our way up. Thine head upon thee is like Carmel, the mountain. It's majestic, it's over all. And the hair of thine head like purple. The king 
is held in the galleries. The idea that the king is taken by your display, your beauty. I'm taken by you. Good thing to tell your wife. How fair and how pleasant art thou, O love. This is the love of desire between man and woman. Sexual, the idea, intimate love. How fair and how pleasant art thou, O love, for delights. So not only does he appreciate her appearance, but as he thinks about her, he thinks about what he's enjoyed with her as his wife. And so it's this all-encompassing package of not only do you look great, but it reminds me of last night, last week, or getaway, whatever the case may be. The marriage bed is pure and honorable, right? Hebrews, undefiled. It's amazing because here what he's saying is he's reflecting on the two of them being one and it's, it's for him, it's a joy. And in Christ, when we honor the Lord in our engagement, we get married, that wedding night, we open up the gift of intimacy and we continue as our, as our married life together. You know, you're, you're, you're sitting there at your, your office or you're at home or whatever it is and, and you, you remember last night or last week, or whatever, and you're like, oh, there's nothing wrong with remembering time intimately with your spouse because that's God-ordained. That's a right application. There's a, there's a book we read long ago because we try to read some and take some nuggets out of it. I believe the book was called Romancing Your Husband. And, uh, and this lady, what she would do to let her husband know, because again, he's out in the working world and there's lots of potential threats and other things. So she tried to do just simple little things to let him know that she desired him. So she would show up at work with the extra keys, open the car and leave lingerie on his, on his windshield or on his mirror or on his steering wheel. Right? So she'd leave different things around for him. Sneak in, put something here, something there. And she, she was basically somewhat aggressively letting him know, I'm your girl. And the guy would talk about coming out with a couple guys, go to a lunch meeting, and here's, you know, some little something hanging on the gear shift or on the whatever. And, uh, and basically all the other guys are like, lucky. His wife desires him. And guess what that spurred him to do? Leave the notes, leave the flowers, leave the little things for her to discover that there's love and there's desire between them. You know, when you were courting, you thought, you know, if I, if I go an extra 10 minutes, I could swing by that card shop, get that really cool card and mail it to her. And then she, you know, you did that stuff. And then you get married, you're like, yeah, well, I mean, it's our 26th anniversary. There's nothing special. So why should I watch out for that? Because pretty soon when you treat your relationship as common, that's when things begin to fall apart. So here, interestingly enough, they've been at this a while, and yet he says, you know, when I think about you, how fair and how pleasant art thou, O love, and that's, again, desire, intimate desire between a husband and wife, the idea of man-woman relationship. When I think about you, oh, for delight, the memory of these things. Verse 7, this thy stature is like to a palm tree, just straight and beautiful. Here we go again. And thy breasts to clusters of grapes, just talking about the whole appearance. I said, verse 8, so he describes her and he's captivated by her. Verse 6, he remembers her and he's sort of caught up in the moment. He talks about the beauty of her, verse 7, thinks about that. Verse 8, he now says, I will. In other words, as I think about how you look and I think about what we've done, I can't wait till I get home. Verse 8, I will go up to the palm tree. She's the palm tree. I will take hold of the boughs thereof, the idea of climbing in. Now also thy breasts shall be as clusters of the vine, and the smell of thy nose like apples. How many are getting the idea this is not just a book on theology? We talked about that. I mean, I know we were trying, some say it's, a, you know, it's an allegory, it's a theology, and we started with, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Well, here we are, you know, seven chapters later, and desire is strong as ever between them. That's a good sign. That's what God intended. Strong desire. Well, so this is all happening. Notice, by the way, chapter 7, 1 through 8 was all Solomon. He's so chatty now. Verse 9, she responds. And the roof of thy mouth is like the best wine for my beloved that goeth down sweetly. That indicates uh, more than a peck on the cheek. Causing the lips of those that are asleep to speak. So she is so captivated by him also that she talks about him in her sleep. I am my beloved's. So back to that question. So where is your beloved? I'll tell you where he is. He's right here with me. I am my beloved's. And his desire, his desire, his longing, his craving could also be, and that the translation of this could be like a beast to devour. His desire is toward me. I have his attention, his affection. And by the way, gentlemen, when a wife knows she has her husband's full attention and affection, that fills her tank. 
And that's not all bedroom, that's throughout the day. You desire to be around her, to hear what she has to say. You know, guys, a suggestion we make in the premarital class, your wife comes in, she's got something to tell you, and you're watching the baseball game or the basketball or football game or whatever, the NASCAR or car or car or whatever you're watching, you know, one way to really let her know how important she is is to either mute it or turn it off. She's, honey, can you? Off. What do you need? Do you know what you just told her in that moment? She's more important than whatever it was you were watching. Yeah, but pastor, they have replay. You can YouTube it. I mean, come on, really? You let her know in that, more, that moment, everything else in your world went on pause to find out what does she need. Do you know what that says to a wife? I'm important in his world. That's, that's big. Instead of, well, yeah, 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 I'll get to it. Yeah, 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 I'll get to it. Yeah, 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 And you don't do it. Why? Because you weren't listening at all. You were vroom, 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 watching whatever. It's amazing how little things like that will let the other know how important they are to you. Okay, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Come, my beloved. Apparently she's now speaking to him. Come, my beloved. Let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourisheth. Let's just see what happens. Whether the tender grape appear. The idea is to loose, open, appear, or break forth. Whether that appear. And the pomegranates bud forth. There will I give thee my loves. And again, this idea of my romance. So she's making a direct request with all the compliments and things back and forth. She's requesting time with him romantically. She's asking him. The mandrakes give a smell. Mandrakes they associated in those days with, with sort of passion, sort of aphrodisiac. Uh, how many have heard of Jacob? One in the back. Anybody else? Two in the front. Three... How many are still awake? Two in the front, three in the back. Okay. Jacob was supposed to marry Rachel. What happened? Laban slipped in Leah on the wedding night. And you remember what happened, ah, you know, and all that. And then he married, worked seven more years, but he went ahead and married Rachel, worked seven more years. And, uh, and so then this, this battle began where Leah would conceive and bring forth children, and Rachel was not able to. So then Bilhah and Zilpah, their handmaids, were, were married to him as concubines. So he ends up two wives, two concubines. And, and Rachel's still having difficulty conceiving. And so Jacob apparently has her, she has his affection. He's there with her most of the time. And so uh, Reuben, one of Leah's sons, goes out and gets mandrakes, which again was supposed to be an aphrodisiac and all that, and, and they think. And, uh, and so goes out to get mandrakes. And as he's coming back, Re uh, Rachel sees this and she says, I want those. I'm the one having the problem with getting some kids. And so what happens is Leah says, tell you what, you can have the mandrakes, but I get Jacob tonight. That's how messed up things got at that point. So Jacob comes in from working in the field, and here's Leah probably all gussied up saying, you're mine tonight because my son purchased you for me at the mandrakes. And so he went into Leah that night and conceived, and then here came Issachar. So mandrakes are mentioned elsewhere in Scripture as part of this intimate uh, rendezvous and, and, and an accelerant or an encourager to these things. You can see it in Genesis 30 and take a look for yourself, but... The mandrakes give a smell. So if you're saying, that name's familiar. Yes, you saw it in Genesis 30. And at our gates, our gates are full of all manner of pleasant fruits. So again, this, this desire, this intimacy, we have all these things happening, and we have things new and old, which I have laid up for thee, O my beloved. So there are things they enjoy of each other they've known, and there are new things they discover. And I will say this. I'll, I'll, I'll just go ahead and do it, and I'll get in trouble. You know, you... You get engaged. No, listen, if you're out there saying, well, I, didn't, I wasn't pure before. I know, well, look, I can only deal with where you today with Jesus. Can't turn back the hands of time. Because if we could, we'd go all the way back to the garden and say, drop it. Don't eat that. Stop. We can't. So I had an unsaved past where I was not honoring to God and how I conducted myself with other ladies. And then I got saved. Then I got engaged. We honored God during our engagement. And we got to our wedding night renewed. And I can tell you, again, the world thinks, you know, why does the world need, we're going on our honeymoon. Really, where are you going? Well, they've got parasailing and bungee jumping and extreme, like, flaming canoe rides and everything else. And, and you're like, where are you going? That doesn't, and then they have horseback riding and jeep and 4 by 4 and, and snorkeling. And, yeah, but where are you going? Well, what do you mean? The reason they need all these activities is there is no mystery. That's already all happened in the flesh. 
So now they got to, we got to entertain ourselves somehow because we're going to get there. What are we going to do? We're just going to sit there and stare at each other. But when you've waited and you've honored God, they say, where are you going? We're going here. What are you going to do? We're going to pull the little card out that says, do not disturb and leave it on the doorknob. It's a whole different world. But the world thinks, well, you know, you get married and things kind of go, eh, eh, and that's what, oh, we got to spice it up. We got to involve, you know, this will, this will help. Let's throw porn in the mix or let's start swinging with other couples. Let me tell you something. I have not been involved with that, but I have watched from the outside and I have seen families and homes destroyed, neighbors destroyed by this nonsense. And it's becoming increasingly more accepted and increasingly more the rage. And, uh, and it's, we've had people that have moved out of neighborhoods because they got tired of being asked as a couple to join other couples. That's how weird it is out there. So what they do, well, we gotta spice it up. What do we do? Well, let's totally go to the flesh. What does it do? It destroys marriages. But in Christ, what you find is there's a greater sensitivity over time to each other, a greater understanding of each other. It's, it's almost like, you know, it's, a, it's like its own dance. With time, you understand each other so much the more that I, I'm here to report 26 years later that things have gotten better and better between me and my wife on this level of intimacy. There's a tenderness and an understanding and all that and, and a history of sickness, health, rich or poor, better or worse. You know, 23 years in diapers and everything else we've been through that we didn't have then. It's got its own value. Completely opposite of what the world thinks. So here she's saying, we have treasures. You know, we have things new and old. There's things we love and there's things we're discovering with time between the two of us. So the mandrakes give a smell. At our gates are all manner of pleasant things or fruits, a new and old, which I've laid up for thee, O my beloved. This is the wife telling the husband her desire for him. Very important. Verse chapter 8, she goes on. Oh, that thou wert as my brother, that sucked the breasts of my mother. That theme keeps coming. That sucked the breasts of my mother. When I should find thee without, I would kiss thee. Yea, I should not be despised. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, this is a little odd, so now she wants to be direct. You can't do that. Leviticus 18. That's, what do you? Take a left turn. Let's go to uh, Genesis 26. Genesis 26. How many have heard of Isaac? A few of you. Good. Genesis 26. Left turn. Verse 1. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went, into, went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed will I give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. Verse 4. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and I will give unto thee thy seed, the seed, or thy seed, all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. How? Who is he talking about ultimately? The Messiah, who will come through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Leah, Judah, David, Jesus, through Mary. All the nations will be blessed through Israel, which, by the way, is why God gave them a law, which is why God had to keep them separate from the pagans around them, which is why they weren't to intermix fabric, for example, because that's what the pagans did for occult power, which is why they were not to cross and intermingle crops, because that's what pagans did for occult power. There are lots of things God gave them in the law to keep them different than the pagans around them, not to make marks and all these other things to Israel to keep them separate, to keep them different, because God had to bring his son through the line of Judah. So he could pay for the sins of the world. And all he asks that you do is receive him in your heart by faith. And you will be saved. And then you will be among the nations that are blessed through his seed who died for us. So I will give all the nations a blessing through thy seed. Verse 5. Because Abraham, that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac dwelt in Gerar. And the men of the place asked him of his wife. Uh oh. And he said, uh, she's my sister, for he feared to say she is my wife. Why? 
Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca, for, for Rebecca, for because she was fair to look upon. Now, if it's his wife and someone wants her, what do they do to get her? Kill Isaac. If it's his sister and someone wants her, what do they have to do? Negotiate with him and pay him a bride price, which gives him the chance to go, babe, we're leaving tonight about midnight when everybody's sleeping. So that's why he did this strategy. Where did he learn this from? Abraham. Well, verse 8, it came to pass when he had been there a long time, so they began to be comfortable, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw, and behold, check this out, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. Well, that's nice. They're playing badminton. No, no, that's not what it's indicating. They're messing around in public. Now, in case you didn't know this, generally husbands and wives would not have that kind of affection in public. That was a no-no. Um, it would be okay in certain forms, but, you know, brother to sister, fine. But what's going on here is not brotherly and sisterly, or they're going, well, that's a really odd family. What's going on between them is not just casual affection from sibling to sibling. This is clearly, wait a second, that's not his sister. That's got to be his wife. So look what happened. Saw them sporting. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, behold, of a surety, she is your wife. You don't do that to her if she's your sister. How sayest thou she's my sister? And Isaac said, well, because I've said, lest I die for her. And Abimelech said, well, what have you done unto us? One of the people might have lightly have lain with thy wife, and thou shouldst have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged the people, saying that he that touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Well, God got him protection. Then Isaac sowed in the land and received the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him, and it went on. So, back to our chapter. Oh, that thou were my brother. Why? Because then I could show you affection in public to a certain level, and no one would think twice of it. But between husband and wife, that was supposed to be for private. How many now got it? Okay, I got two of you. That's good. I'll accept that. Oh, that thou wert my brother that sucked the breasts of my mother. When I should find thee without, so in public, I would kiss thee. I could shower you with some affection. Yea, I should not be despised, because that would be okay to express affection for a sibling, but it would be considered crossing the line to do the same for a spouse. That should be left for home. I would lead thee and bring thee into my mother's house. No one would think twice of it if we're siblings. Who would instruct me? That gets interesting. Who would instruct me? Instructor in what? Baking? Sewing? Caring for the chickens? Instructor in what? How to be a wife. <gasps> you mean that, that kind of education? Shouldn't we send them to school for that? Are you kidding? Best place for your kids to learn about intimacy in a marriage is hopefully from their parents. And what we've tried to do with our family is when we get asked questions, and it takes a while, you know, and funny, because the first generation, we call them Gen 1, Gen 2, and Whitney's Gen 3. First generation took a little longer, and then because we have older ones, and now we had somebody get engaged and married, and now Megan's, Megan, did I? We're going to be grandparents. Megan is, you know, expecting, and so more questions come up and all that. So Gen 2 is a little further ahead of the curve, but we would always simply answer the questions as we had to. When they, when they want to know something, what do you want to know? We would explain what they want to know, being careful to give what they wanted to know, and we'd stop and say, do you want to know anything else? And they said no, well, then we left it there until later. By the way, with Gen 1, my, my wife was kind of worried, and, and the girls started, you know, that time was coming when they were going to realize that they're women, or going into women. And Lori was always like, ah, she goes, you tell them. <laughs> like, but you're the, you tell them. I'm like, wow, are you serious? So I ended up having the, I think the first two or three there in the bedroom they used to be in. And I was like, well, dad needs to talk to you because you know, you know how mom has babies, right? And they're like, yeah. I said, well, and you know how babies come out of them. Yeah. Well, see, in girls, there's a, there's a little, there's a little bed in your tummy, see, and as you get old enough, that bed eventually gets ready that someday you can have a baby grow in there, and then and you'll... Remember, I'm, we're starting early. And, uh, and so, in order for that bed to be ready for the baby, it's got to be changed once a month. <laughs> and they were like, great, got it. No problem. Like, makes perfect sense. And she's out on the hallway going... <clears throat> I'm like, you want a job? You want to tell them? You know, I'm doing the best I can. 
I would rather be the one to tell my kids. And you know, it's interesting, um, my, my first generation sons, some things we'd be working, we'd be outside working on a project and one of my sons would say, dad, and start asking me questions. And I would answer it in a way that, okay, what do you wanna know? And I'd answer as best I could and, and again, answer the facts, answer what they need to know and work with them. And then I would say, is there anything else you wanna know? And they're like, no, that's, that's good for now. I said, okay, well, if you ever have a question, don't be shy, just come ask me and I'll do the best I can to help you understand. When you wanna know something, I'll be happy to tell you, but until you wanna know something, I'd rather let you just be a kid. And so over the years, we've had, as you know, and it's as, as it talked about in, in Deuteronomy 6, right? Teach your children, you're rising up, you're sitting down, all you do. And so here, the idea, she's saying that I would bring you in the home of my, my mother into her bedroom and be instructed by her. You know, it should be a place to, to talk about and instruct these things within our children and give them the godly standard. You're going to meet someone and you're going you're gonna to, quote, fall in love with them. And as your friendship becomes so strong, you begin to awaken desire. Desire awakens and you realize it's so strong that you're actually willing to give up your singleness, forsake all others, get engaged, get on a wedding night, and then enjoy the marriage. Those are the things we've tried to talk to them about throughout the years. There was, if you, I know I've mentioned this, I think, before in our study so far in this book, but Corey Ten Boom had a question for her father. He was a repair, kind of a, a craftsman. He had a tool bag and he said, Corey, the question pick up my tool bag. And she said, you know, it's too heavy for me, Dad. And he said, the question you're asking me now is too heavy for you to carry. But when you get older, I will explain it to you. There's a right way to do it. But what better place than in the home of their parents to learn these things? And there are some things I will do with the premarital class that we record it, but there are some things we don't record. We hand out some books to them that I'd mentioned that we, we hand out to help them with some questions and Q&As and other stuff I talked about already through our study. But I will also give them some practical wisdom. Hey, sometimes you can end up with something called honeymooner's disease. What's that? Well, somebody gets a bladder infection, usually her. And, you know, these are things you need to be wary of because here you are, brand new, married, and maybe you've honored God, and you get to, and you're like, what's happening? What's happening is you, you honored God, and suddenly you've got a whole new activity happening in your life, and your body's responded. Those kind of things. And some of them, like, nobody told us that. Well, we're telling you because we found out the hard way. So we might as well pass on the love instead of saying, hey, uh, when this happens... Go see a doctor. More than you wanted to know. No wonder we're not live streaming tonight. <laughs> I would lead you and bring you into my mother's house who would instruct me. I would cause the, here we go. You figure this out. I would cause thee to drink out of the, uh, to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. Work on that at home. His left hand should be under my head. His right hand should embrace me. She desires them. Verse 4, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that you stir not up nor awake till my love, again, the, the idea of the word for desire between an intimate relationship, until my, nor wake my love until he pleases. So verse 5, who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I raised thee up under the apple tree. There thy mother brought thee forth. There she brought thee forth that bare thee. Some argue, verse 5, perhaps, as Solomon is remembering, who is this, this one that I love that has my affection, that this may be where they first saw each other, we don't know, but that's what some feel verse 5 is telling us. Verse 6, it continues, she seems now to respond, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love, again, this word is human love for another human, desire, intimate desire, ahaba is the word in the Hebrew, between a man and a woman, this kind of desire, for love, intimate desire, is strong as death. Passion can drive people to do some great things in the right direction, really wrong things in the wrong direction. Love is as strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. Make sure you forsake all others so you don't have to deal with that. The coals thereof are coals of fire. When this is stirred up, the heat, the passion, it can burn which hath a most vehement flame. It can consume you, by the way. And if you're not careful, lust will do the same. Many waters cannot quench, again, ahaba, the word again, desire between a husband and wife. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. It's basically saying not even a cold shower. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, again, ahaba, the desire between human to human, man to woman. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly contemned. In other words, this kind of real desire, love, and affection you don't buy. This is something that is earned in a trusting relationship. You don't buy this. 
Then we change gears, verse 8. We, plural, note that. We have a little sister. Who's talking? Apparently her brothers. Just cluing you in. We have a little sister, and she hath no breasts. Gee, this family's pretty honest with each other. What do you think? Why would she have no breasts? Beginning in verse 8. Because she's a little sister. This is when she was not yet pubescent or immature. We have a little sister. She hath no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for? So what do we, right now she's a little kid. We the brothers, as I mentioned, are charged with watching out for her. If someone wants to marry her, we negotiate the bride price. Remember, Laban was in that negotiation there, Jacob. And you'll see that again with Rebecca also, Laban involved in some of those processes. So here we have a little sister. What do we do when the day comes and someone wants to betroth her and to marry her? What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Well, there's some conditions. Verse 9. If she be a wall, we will build upon her a palace of silver, something glorious for all to see. If she be a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. You're saying, I'm not a contractor. What are they talking about? Okay, Middle Eastern riddle. What can you do through a door that you cannot do through a wall? Well, simple. How many of you would like to exit right between that? Can you? Now, without a lot of effort, how many of you can easily exit through those? What's the difference? One is not passed through, the other is. Let me be even more blunt. One cannot be moved through. In other words, she has not opened herself to anyone. She is a virgin, as opposed to a door others have had her. How many now got the illustration? If she be a wall, no one has passed through her. She knows no man. Well, then there's great value, palace of silver. If she be a door, not pure open to others to have enjoyed, we put her in boundaries. We enclose her in cedar. So we have a sister. She's immature. We're going to one day have to give her over. If she's honorable, great. We can build a dynasty, a legacy, whatever. If she's not, then we're going to basically have to uh, restrict her and her freedom. Just putting it out there. So that was the question they were trying to figure out. What do we do? What do we do? What do we do? She answers, verse 10, I am a wall. Now you get it. What is she saying? No one has had me. I'm pure. Remember we talked about a garden enclosed, a fountain sealed from last week, speaking of her purity, her virginity. I am a wall, and my breasts are like towers. Well, I guess she's setting the record straight with her brothers. There it is again. Then was I in his eyes as one that found favor, a shalom, or peace. So I have grown up, I have been pure, I have matured and developed, and I am desired. There you go, all that in verse 10. Solomon had a vineyard at Balhaman. He let out the vineyard unto keepers, plural. Every one for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. So it seems to speak in verse 11, the vineyard, Balhaman, the keepers are her brothers. And so now Solomon desires her. She's come to age. They had a job of being guardians. She's now reached maturity. Solomon desires her. So he's, praying, he's paying a bride price or a dowry, the idea of thousand pieces of silver. So it seems that this is going to those who kept her charge. We'll find out for sure in heaven. Verse 12 seems to add to that. My vineyard, which is mine before me. In other words, her purity, herself, her person. Thou, O Solomon, must have a thousand. Again, some say it speaks of his harem. We went on until we get to heaven. And those that keep the fruit thereof, 200. So either it's talking about his harem and his concubines, or It's adding to verse 8, and that is, she is the vineyard, she's being purchased, that is the dowry, it is the bride price, it's a thousand pieces plus 200, her bride price going to both brothers. We'll know for sure in heaven. Meanwhile, we'll go to verse 13. So now Solomon responds, Thou that dwellest in the gardens, the companions hearken to thy voice. In other words, there are lots of people around me, again, he has a harem, but you stand out. Thou that dwellest in the gardens, the companion, hearken to thy voice. Cause me to hear it. You stand out. Verse 14, she appears to respond to him. Make haste, my beloved. So he says he desires her. She responds, I desire you. Make haste, my beloved. Be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of spices. The mountains of spices, she's referring to herself. Come, my beloved, and partake of your wife is the invitation. Know the end. No, they lived happily ever after. No, you're thinking, that was a different book. Well, A, it's Hebrew poetry. B, it's 3,000 years ago. But C, it still applies. 
God wanted the marriage relationship to be one of desire for each other for a lifetime. Not only the friendship, which by the way is the foundation, the life experience, which is part of the roller coaster called marriage, the goods, the bads, the uglies, and all the other things, sickness, health, rich or poor, better or worse, but then that special treasure between the two of you that the two become one. God intended that to be for a lifetime. That's his heart here. It reminds me of that chapter 5, verse 1, where the whole wedding night's happening, the feast, and there was that comment, drink, oh friends, drink, yea, drink deeply, abundantly, oh beloved. Enjoy this gift God has given to the two of you that night to bring you together as one. A couple things to note. Interesting here, this book, Song of Solomon, one commentator said, is God's endorsement of physical love between a husband and a wife. I would say so. He included it in the book. Marriage is to be monogamous, permanent, self-giving and as a unit between husband and wife in which spouses are intentionally devoted to and committed to each other and take delight in each other. And what's interesting too, with all these chapters, all eight chapters on intimacy here and about the marriage, children aren't mentioned. Aside from she was a child and she was in the charge of her brothers, children aren't mentioned. So to say, well, this is only for procreation. Well, Song of Solomon says it's for pleasure between a husband and wife, and the byproduct may be children, if God blesses. So that argument, well, it's just for this. No, so all eight chapters are about it's between a husband and wife for unity, for joy, and for a special treasure between them. Pointing that out. Interesting, too. It's, it's all about intimacy being the bonding agent between a husband and wife that spurs on desire, tenderness, care, and affection. In other words, these things are supposed to be very important within a wife and a husband's relationship. And one last thought here. Do you remember in chapter 4, verse 12, as a fountain enclosed again, as a garden that is sealed? That was her wedding night. She was pure. She was a wall. She was a virgin. She gets her a wedding night. They consummate the marriage. That morning where she's now a wife, because they have done it God's way, she is no less pure that morning than she was the night before because that virginity, that purity, was to be given to her husband. When it's given to her husband in the confines of a marriage on the wedding night, it is now what God intended for the two of them to enjoy. So she is no less virtuous in the morning than she was in the evening because she has given to her husband that which was for him to bless their marriage and perhaps, if God blesses, to bring them children. You know, the world today, because of the mess that they've made, and, and you know, it, porn's not good enough anymore. Now it's got to be extreme porn, or this porn, or that porn, or whacked porn, or whatever, all this weird stuff out there. Just like sports aren't good enough anymore. You can't just ride a snowmobile. You've got to flip it three times. Extreme snorts, extreme, you know, everything's extreme. Extreme makeup, extreme this, extreme that. But what God intended it to be was just beautiful. Beautiful, simple, and enjoyed. It's not dirty. It's a gift of God to a husband and wife to enjoy until God takes them home or one or the other. Now, one last thing. We talked about allegorical. The Spirit of God will be with you. He will convict the sin of the world of righteousness, sin, and judgment. That's the work that the Spirit of God does in our hearts to show us we've sinned, we failed a holy God, and God who is holy must judge sin. If he's the judge of all the earth and he does what's right, he has to judge sin. When that conviction brings us to the understanding that we are in trouble before a holy God, that we cry out for his forgiveness provided through his son, then we are not only forgiven our sins, but Ephesians 1, 2 Corinthians 1 tells us he gives us the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God comes into our hearts. That's where we're born again. And then there's the third relationship. As we rise up to be witnesses, the Spirit of God will come upon you. There's this beautiful picture of God drawing us to himself. When we believe God bringing us into a deep relationship to himself. And as we are willing to make ourselves available, God pouring out himself on us to empower us. You see, the husband and wife relationship in Ephesians 5 talks about, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and his church. A groom has to say, I take you as my bride. A bride has to say, I take you as my husband or my groom. When he does and she does, they do. Now we've got a marriage. And so we often will talk about in a wedding ceremony, here the groom is waiting for the bride to come forward, to come forward and finally receive him as her husband. But she has to make that decision for herself. 
A bride can be in the room and yet never say, I do, so they're not married. A bride can be right in front of the pastor or the officiant or the, or the judge, justice of the peace, but if she doesn't say, I do, even though they're right next to each other, they're not married. It's not until he does and she does that we have a marriage. And Paul said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and his church. We know what Jesus says. If you'll receive me into your heart, I do forgive you. He's already standing here waiting to receive anyone who comes to me. He said, if any man comes to me, I will no wise cast him out. In other words, I do. I will forgive you. But every one of us for ourselves, like a bride, has to come forward of our own free will and say, Lord, I've, I've failed. I've offended you. I've sinned against you. Will you forgive me? And we know his answer. I do. But you have a part to play too. And he said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and his church. Now, please don't misunderstand me. We don't have a physical intimacy with God like a husband and wife have physically. But when we become the bride of Christ, he puts the spirit of God into us. And now we have this love relationship where we know that we are our beloveds. And he is ours. So even within the marriage relationship, there's a beautiful picture of this desire that God has for us to be in a relationship with him. And when we come and ask for his forgiveness, he gives us the spirit with the Spirit of God in us, God begins to reveal to us not only His Word, but the deep and the personal things of God to us for ourselves. So the marriage relationship and the intimacy between a marriage is again a reflection of spiritually, in a sense, what God wants with us. He wants us growing in our relationship with Him. He wants us having a deeper knowledge and sensitivity to Him. He wants that closeness with us to grow over time and become more rich. Great book. We're out of time. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we do pray that you would go with us. And Lord, as we move forward and we get to Isaiah, awesome book. Amazing the things that you would tell him 800 years before you would send your son, born of a virgin, who would be beaten with a scourge, die between thieves, buried with the rich, and yet rise again. That he would come and save us and open our eyes and the ears of the deaf and the lame would walk and the mute would speak. But Lord, this evening, we thank you for Song of Solomon. You put it in here because you wanted us to consider it. And I do pray if there are any marriages saying, you don't know what I deal with at home. God, I pray that they would come before you as a husband and wife, get on their knees and ask that you might reveal to them those areas in their marriage that need to change so they can have a richness between them, a joy, and their own special dance. Thank you for all these things and thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen.